Hi everybody, my name is Jim and this is the Lake Effect Gardener. This episode, as I had mentioned in my last episode, is going to be a bit of a chat. And this chat is going to be how I am going to be using the Lake Effect Garden as a victory garden. So it's absolutely no secret to anyone who follows this channel that I have a great affinity for vintage, retro, historical things. And it's been that way for most of my life. I've always had a very strong draw to things like that. And so after a very long time, Okay, and this is something that I've been considering for quite some time, but never have I had the motivation to do it, is I'm going to be treating my garden as a victory garden. So what does that mean? Victory gardens kind of came into existence during World War I, okay? And I believe this is something that has happened on both sides of the pond. Now, when it comes to World War I, I really didn't do a ton of research on what was going over the pond over in Britain, but I did a lot of reading about what was going on here in the States. And the idea of the Victory Garden is to produce enough veg for your family to live on for a whole year. Thus, cutting back the amount of veg that was being purchased at stores and the idea was the you know the glut of of vegetables that were being produced mass produced by farmers and things those things could be handed out to people who did not have the ability to do the gardens but also for supplying food to other countries and for the soldiers who were overseas so it became a popular thing during World War I, but my interest lied, uh, lied? No. lies in the victory gardens of World War II, which I've always had a very big fascination over the history of World War II. I have read and I have watched and I have listened to all sorts of documentaries about it. And not only just the aspects of the war, but I've, I've listened to a great deal of FDR's fireside chats and old radio broadcasts and things like that always very much interested me. Also, I, the stories that I grew up with from my, my Aunt Jo and, and, and people who lived through it, even my father who, even though he was born during the war, you know, has recollections of the time, you know, immediately following the war, which, you know, things were still things were still difficult for people, okay? You had to grow your own food in order to survive. So I think maybe about four or five years ago, I had stumbled upon the wartime farm videos that were released by the BBC. And that's Ruth Goodman, Alex Langlands, and Peter Ginn. And they went and they lived on a farm. And they basically were recreating the wartime farm and how things were handled by the, the British Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Food and things like that. And I was so incredibly fascinated from the standpoint that things weren't so bad here in the States. Um, we, our, our, our department, our Secretary of Agriculture sent out pamphlets and leaflets and things like that, but it wasn't as an intense thing as it was over in Britain. And that has a lot to do with the fact that a lot of British food sources were coming in from abroad and because of the blockades that were being happening, you know, that were happening in the Atlantic, their availability to receive foods from other countries were almost completely wiped out. So the country was basically in charge of feeding themselves, okay, creating their gardens, creating, turning over all of their uh, 
livestock and cattle and things like that in order to produce food for the country. Completely fascinating. And it's really interesting too because, you know, I have grown up learning how to make do and mend and to, I mean, you guys have seen the videos of the upcycling and, and things like that. And that is something that has always kind of been ingrained in my soul, but it's something that I just do on an everyday basis. This is not something that uh, I think about or it's, it's just something I do. If I get a hole in my socks, I darn them, <laughs> you know? Why go out and buy a new pair of socks if you got one tiny little hole and you know how to fix it? Okay, so it has always intrigued me. I've always wanted to get into it and I've done a lot of research and study. So I've got some stuff here, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to include in the description box below all the links to the manuscripts that I have. Not all of them, okay? There's, there's a couple of things that you may be able to find online. I have some other things ordered that I found on eBay and things like that, which is a really great source for finding manuscripts and literature on, on the, you know, just the everyday of living during the war. Now, why am I doing this? This garden has always been a very three season garden. Okay. Three season, not even, I mean, spring I've planted things. Summer, I've yielded things. And fall, I still am yielding things, but it's mostly, okay, I'm gonna dig everything up and put the beds to rest. But upon reading further, I'm and watching other people's videos on YouTube, um, especially Vivi, okay, who, as far as I'm concerned, is really, she has, she's got it. She's got it down. If you guys have never watched Vivi's uh, Kitchen Garden before, I will also put a link below to direct you there because Vivi lives off of her garden. Her food sources, the, the greatest amount of her food sources come from her garden. She grows for the whole year. I'm thinking to myself, would I be able to do that here in Western New York and Buffalo? Is it feasible? And I think it's going to be. It may not all work out where I can grow as much as I can in the ground, but now that I have that tunnel and fingers crossed that tunnel is going to stay put, <laughs> I can really extend my growing year. So let me show you what I have in the way of materials here. The first book I have, okay, well, what's gonna be interesting about this, I should say this before I even show you this stuff, is I, I'm actually going to be doing a compare, a contrast, a hybridized version of Garden for Victory, or as, as the British would say, Dig for Victory campaign here at this garden. I don't know if it's been done. I've watched a lot of uh, Victory Garden videos on YouTube. I don't know if it's been done. If it has, super. If not, I think this is gonna be really, really interesting. So the movement in America was called Garden for Victory. And I'm sure if you have any, uh, you know, recollection of seeing any of this, you know that this is a very famous kind of design. Okay. Garden for Victory. I actually have a wooden, it's, it's a, a hanging, an indoor hanging that's hanging in my kitchen that has that, and it was hand painted that has this very insignia on it. So in America, we called it victory gardening or garden for victory in Britain their campaign was called Dig for Victory. Same campaign, kind of different in, in its ways. I mean, but so is, you know, <laughs> so is Great Britain and the United States. Very similar when it comes to some things, very different when it comes to others. So I purchased this book online. It wasn't very much. And this is basically a compilation book. So it's Dig for Victory, Monthly Growing Guides and Commentary by John Harrison. Okay, and this basically is a compilation volume of all of the different pamphlets that were released to the public and issued by the Ministry of Agriculture. So it's, it goes through every single month of the year, okay, from January to December, and it gives you helpful hints and things that you need to know when it comes to preparing 
your garden, preparing your plants, what to plant, what to replace plants with, when to plant. It's, it's really interesting. It's really good. And then um, I really couldn't find any authentic everything. Well, I shouldn't say authentic. A lot of it's authentic. But a lot of the Victory Garden books that I have found here in America. Can you guys see my breath? It's really, oh, it's really cold here today. I was wearing shorts last week and it's freezing. The manuscripts that I found online in the way of books, a lot of it were a, kind of a new interpretation. I was really looking for the old stuff. So as it happens, a couple of Google searches and I found a great archive of manuscripts, of original manuscripts from America during wartime that talks about the Victory Gardens. And they were all scanned and uploaded um, and free, <laughs> which was great. I will include those links as well if you want to take a look at them. But just to show you a couple of the manuscripts, you can see this is a scan of a very old manuscript. It's from 1940. This one says 1947, but I think this one was released in 1941. Okay. I could be wrong. Okay, so I have this. And then here's another one, The Victory Garden Guide. All right. And this is April of 1944. So you can see 1944, that's getting close to the end of the war, but still very, very prevalent. Victory Garden Guide. Okay. And then on top of that, I also found some old seed catalogs. Unfortunately, these places do not exist anymore, which makes me sad because I was like, I, as, as soon as I saw these and I was looking through the catalogs, I'm like, I wonder if these still exist. I did a Google search. They're not. So this is the Job P. Wyatt Sons. And they do have sections on, you know, the Victory Garden. Okay, really interesting. And a lot of the varieties that I grow, veg, are in here, which is neat. That has a lot to do with the fact that I grow mostly heirloom varieties, okay? Old traditional varieties. And then the last one, this is from the Knox Seed Company, Stockton, California. And this is a garden guide from 1943. I just think they're so beautiful. There's a certain sim simplicity about it. You know what I mean? So, the idea for me is I'm going to try to combine both of these ideas of Victory Gardens. I'm going to include, include a little bit of the British stuff. I'm going to include, you know, a lot of the American stuff. And the reason why it's going to be a lot of American stuff is just because of the climate that I'm in. Okay, a lot of the stuff that is in this book, and I've read it, has to do with warmer climates. Okay, so it may not be a total, you know, workout for me. But things that I can't normally grow over the winter here, like I said, can go in the tunnel. I just want to read a quick excerpt out of one of them. Okay, this is actually the first, is this the first one? Yeah, this one, the Victory Garden Leaders Handbook. And I read it and I was like, Yes, this is our philosophy in general. Even if we don't know anything about victory gardening, this is our philosophy. It says, to be a good victory garden leader, you must first be interested in the job. <laughs> that is a pretty serious prerequisite. Yes, you have to be serious about the job. Okay, not serious, interested, yes. Then you must take up the job of one, interesting other people, which hopefully I've done with this channel and with my friends and family, okay? Two, starting them on the right gardening track. Again, I've hopefully done that with this channel. Three, helping them to keep on the right track, which, you know, all of these fabulous YouTube gardeners that are out there, they're all doing this, which is really kind of cool from a historical standpoint. A great many people are eager to become victory gardeners, but they need information. This is really your job, information. It plays a bigger part in this war every day, and those who have helpful information are the frontline fighters on the home front. 
The best way to interest people in Victory Gardens is to talk to them. You can answer questions and build enthusiasm fast when talking. But most of us can only get around to talking to a limited number of people. Well, this is where the platforms like Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, they really have their benefits, okay? I'm talking to people from France, <laughs> Denmark, Germany, you know, Australia, uh, people that I'd never ever consider, not consider, but never have I dreamt of being in contact with. So that's, that's pretty exciting. A way of reaching more folks is to send them letters. If you belong to an organization which has a mimeograph machine, <laughs> of course we know the mimeograph machine of today is the phone, okay? You will be able to reach everyone in your area very easily. Perhaps you can invite these people to a meeting, okay? These, okay, I'm just gonna keep going, okay, without me saying, and YouTube, and YouTube. Give them a letter of interest by tracing a drawing on a stencil with a stylus, perhaps a cartoon or a symbol from this handbook or a magazine. A suggested letter will be found on this page, okay? So there is, they, they give you kind of like a form letter that you can use. At the meeting, tell them about Victory Gardens using the material in this handbook for a starter and describing your own pleasure in a garden. Point out the nutritional advantages for a family. Make it clear that an hour or so a day will keep a fairly good-sized garden producing abundantly. Explain to them that home-processed vegetables and fruits will not be deducted from their ration allotments. You may want to bring an experimental gardener to talk if you are not one yourself. Perhaps you can get help from the local Victory Garden Committee. But get the people interested and get them informed. So in a way, I have kind of been setting that stage with this channel. So lots of great information. Please check out the links that are below and you can take a deeper dive into you know, what this is all about. Now moving forward, after doing all this reading, I'm thinking to myself, how I have my garden planned right now is not going to be sufficient to do a victory garden. Okay, there's a bit of a turnover that happens during the season, during the growing season, so that you can maximize production in your garden. That's something that I have never done. It's always been throw the plants in, maybe, you know, have a couple of things on the backup like lettuce and, and things that, you know, turn over quick so that you can replace it and keep things going. But there are things in these manuscripts that talk about the turnover for example, peas. When you're done growing your peas, you can plant beets. Okay, that's not something I've ever considered. It's always been one crop of peas, one crop of beets. Okay, on the flip side, if you have a crop of, you know, fast growing bush beans or, or the like, once those are done and you have them out, you could actually do a crop of peas or something else that will tolerate the colder climate. So this has totally rocked my world. And I've done a lot of thinking and a lot of sitting and I've done to start to modify my, my planting, kind of my ideas for the garden, okay? So I'm still going to be growing everything that I said that I was going to be growing, but I'm going to have to do some switch ups when it comes to where they're going to go. Speaking of which, well, before I get to that, I also have on hand because I collect old things. I have these old manuscripts from the wartime era, okay, from the 40s, the early 40s. This one's Hecker's Household Hints. You gotta love a little alliteration. And this was my grandmother's. <laughs> and she even put some newspaper clippings in there, some old ones. But this is great. This is something that would have been used when it comes to just basic household shortcuts and things, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something that I might utilize. I have a recipe book here. And um, this was also from, let's see, copyright 1940. I just love, I love the artwork. Isn't that awesome? And I love that it's tartan. 
Anyways, so there's some really great recipes in here. And this was from my Aunt Jo, okay? And she labeled everything, okay? Can you see what that says? I'll hold it really close. Very old, okay, save. Given to me by Mrs. Chester Spittler, North Evans, New York. Now, even if this weren't old, <laughs> I wouldn't have gotten rid of it because my aunt put this on here in her handwriting. Also, I have, this was my grandmother's. I actually have two copies of this, and this was um, published in the early 40s as well. I have one copy that was my Aunt Jo's, and then I have one copy that was my grandma's who lived here, and it's the American Woman's Cookbook, okay? And it's a really thick volume, and I've done some recipes in here, but there are some really interesting shortcuts, okay? And it talks about um, how to do, you know, how to make the most out of the food that you have, and it gives you all sorts of interesting um, points and tips about saving fat and rendering things and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Which watching the wartime farm, I know that there were also a lot of manuscripts that were handed out by the British government about, you know, making the most of everything that you have. Okay, so this is, this is the first time I've done a chat, like a real chat, just me and and my voice. So a couple more things before I wrap up. <laughs> and this goes along with Dear Vivi and her video about um, merchandise that has been purchased online. So I ordered seed potatoes from a company that I usually order seeds from. I'm not going to mention who they are. I did order seed potatoes from them last year. They didn't end up coming, so I had to buy potatoes like from Amazon, which I did not want to do. But I had to anyways, <laughs> if you recall how those poor seed potatoes fared, you know, and the huge crop of soil and the odd hickory nut that I got. Anyways, so I ordered from them again this year thinking, okay, the pandemic has, we've had a whole year now. I'm sure they've got everything fixed and worked out. So I ordered from them again. Again, I got, you know, I got crickets from their end about these seed potatoes. They sent me their seeds, but not the seed potatoes. And I call, oh, I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. They gave me the runaround. We will give you a full refund. Okay, great. Super. So meanwhile, I went to, to a local shop here and was very happy to see that they had a very large amount of seed potatoes. And it just so happens that they had two out of the three varieties that I was planning on growing. I was thrilled. It's like, great, this is perfect. This is wonderful. So but what do we have here? Yukon Gold, okay. And then Kennebec. And then this one would be, you know, this is going to be my uh, long season or my late season potato, which is a Nor Norcota russet. Okay, so that was not on the docket to plant this year. So I got this and I was like, this is fine. I love russet potatoes. They're great for baking and for other things. Fast forward <laughs> about a month and uh, and this for me, and this, this showed up on my doorstep at the beginning of this week. <laughs> my other seed potatoes. So I didn't get my refund. And I was keeping an eye on it, you know, making sure that they did. And I didn't, and they didn't. And I was like, okay, well, I, you know, I'm gonna deal with that at some point. Well, they didn't need to because they sent them along. And so I'm just gonna open these. I haven't opened them yet. Oh, Jesus, Jenny Jenkins, this, uh, this packaging. Oh. <laughs> Yukon Gold. Kiyuka Gold. Oh. 
kind of back. So now I have twice as many potatoes <sighs> as I was, you know, intending on growing, which I guess having more is always better, but I'm going to have to figure out where all of these are going to go because by golly, I'm going to plant them. So I have a glut of seed potatoes now. I will give some away for sure, but I definitely want to try growing some more. And then on top of that, I was preoccupied about my onion seeds that I had grown, but now I've repotted them. They're starting to take off. They're looking really, really good. So I've got all of those. And then on top of that, I also, because I was worried, <laughs> I have onion sets. So long story short, I'm gonna have to do some reconfiguring. I think I'm gonna bring those grow bags into, into production again. Um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna do the seed potatoes in there. I might, I might make those grow bags for my greens, okay? And then where I'm gonna have my lettuce and my greens, I might dig the potatoes in. I definitely wanna do potatoes in the ground. I was a little disappointed about how the seed potatoes fared in those grow bags last year. I don't want to take that risk again. So, and then with the onion sets too, I'm gonna to have to find a spot for those. I mean, I will, it won't be a problem, but I might, I might end up having to do a little bit more bed creation. And I don't think I'm going to be going with a raised bed because that costs money. And I'm, I really want to keep things at a minimum. So I might just find a bit of earth and dig it over the old fashioned way. So this is great. I have a lot of storage worthy things here, which will be great for my dig for victory garden, my victory garden here. So that'll be wonderful. I can store a lot of this stuff, which brings me to the last part of this video, of this chat, is the storage of everything. Now, I'm sure I've expressed this before. When it comes to storing food in my house, I do not have space. I really don't. I don't have a basement on this house. It was not built with a basement, so I don't have good storage down there. I do not have, I don't have some kind of a root cellar situation. So that's going to be difficult. However, there is a portion of my garage, okay, that you've never seen before. You've maybe seen the doorway of it when I was doing my upcycle videos, like when I was building things in my garage. And this addition to the garage is adjacent and it's as long as my garage. It's not terribly deep, but it's as long as my garage. And inside there, I just have stuff stored in the way of like junk, <laughs> not junk. I've got some furniture in there. I've got some different stuff. That place was originally built by my grandfather to store all of his train memorabilia. He was a huge train enthusiast. The Penn Central, New York Central, there's artifacts, there's, there's like jackets, like you know, train engineer jackets and hats and lanterns and all sorts of stuff. And then on top of it, there's also, he's got, he was, he collected model trains as well. So there's the Lionel train set that's in there. He's got this huge train set up on a table and all of that stuff is really, really valuable. And I really enjoyed playing with it as a child and stuff like that. And we'd go in there and, you know, it was kind of that fun, magical place that I would go but it is useful space. So I am not getting rid of any of it. I'm going to clean that area out. There's shelving all over the place. There's like a wardrobe in there. And I'm gonna store all of the train stuff safely in um, plastic totes. And I'm gonna utilize that area for storage. So when I do canning, when I do drying, when I harvest all of my winter squash and things like that, I'm going to set that area up for storage. 
okay? And that's another thing that I've been, it's been on my mind for the longest time and I've never really gotten around to doing it. So this is all going to be great motivation for me to just get stuck in and take care of it. So you guys will be seeing videos about that. You'll be seeing videos of me processing this food when it comes to either freezing or drying or canning. I do have a lot of interesting recipes and things that I will show you for the veg that I'm going to collect during the year. And um, a lot of different preservation techniques as well. I do have a pressure canner. My dad and I went in on one together. I've been using it and I have used it before um, to process beans and other non-acidics that, and I've made soups and sauces and stews and things like that, that I can also bottle up. All of this stuff can be stored in there. So this is where we're headed, guys. I'm really, really interested on how this is gonna go. This is gonna give me great motivation. I hope you guys are interested in this campaign. It's not going to be at the forefront of every single episode that I give you, okay? But everything that I do from here on out, I'm going to have this Victory Garden kind of template in mind. So what do you think? Tell me in the comments box below. Is this something that you're interested in? And this is a... Uh, this is also something I would love lots and lots of feedback about, okay? I've done a lot of research, but it's never been something that I've actually done before. So any tips and, 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 and mentions you want to make of anything, please do. And I have to say, especially to my British garden friends, going through this book, you guys do a lot of this stuff already. You Reading through this, I'm like, yeah, and this is stuff that I learned from your videos believe it or not. So uh, that's really, really cool. And I don't know if it's something that you guys have researched or it's just something that has been passed down, in which case that really, that's exciting to me. If that's something that's been passed down to you, you guys passed it down to me. I love it. All right, guys, end of chat. So for my next video, hmm, I don't know. I'm still doing a lot of sewing right now. I might you know, try to get the rest of that pergola area done. Not sure. I do have a load of compost coming too. So we'll see. The next video, completely, I have no idea. But hopefully whatever it is, it will be good. You guys will be interested, etc., etc. So that's it from me. Thanks so much for watching. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. Oh, and I forgot. Yes, one last thing. I've hit 400 subscribers. I know that's probably not a big deal, but I've been filming for 10 months. 400 subscribers. That makes me so happy. Thank you all who have subscribed to this channel. I really appreciate it. I love this community. You guys are great. I love talking to you guys, contacting you guys. Love hearing what you have to say. So thanks so much, everybody. All right. I'm done. I'm going to go now. Thanks so much, everybody, and I'll see you really soon. So long.